Hi, my name is Kelly Goff. I'm a contributing editor for TheLoop21.com and a regular contributor to The Huffington Post. Well, the funny thing is, I don't know that I really decided, or what's the saying that I don't know if I found it, it sort of found me in mm -hmm. some ways. Um, I'd always been interested in politics, uh, in part because my parents had always volunteered and displayed an interest. They are part of the civil rights generation. Mm -hmm. And so they had always impressed upon me from the time I was little, so little I can't even remember the first time how important it is to vote and to have a voice in the political process. They always tease me about the fact that I picked my first presidential candidate when I was nine. And it was, for the record, Richard Gephardt. And apparently I said at dinner, when asked to defend my position and my, my choice of Richard Gephardt, it was because I liked his commercials. I actually think it's probably because he had red hair. And you know, when you're a kid, something that makes someone look different, you know? And so all of the other guys looked alike from my vantage point as a kid, and he had red hair. So I liked his commercials, you know? There's a lot going on there. Um, so I went to college, and I graduated from NYU. I was at the Gallatin School of Individualized Study, which I loved, and so shout out to them. Mm -hmm. And while I was at Gallatin, I actually interned on a couple of campaigns, uh, the last one of which was a cam campaign for a little-known senator by the name of Hillary Clinton. <laughs> and I started working on that campaign. Gosh, I don't think they'd even, they hadn't even hired a campaign manager by the time I got in there and was like answering phones and stuffing envelopes and stuff. Mm -hmm. So that kind of set me on my, my path because then when I graduated from college, I worked for a member of Congress here in New York, and um, it's somewhat of a long convoluted story, but really what happened is I met several friends, a couple of friends that I reconnected with who were all like me and that they were young and black, and they were identifying themselves as independents as opposed to just calling themselves Democrats. And by I think the fourth person I spoke to who caught me off guard because I thought, you know, we're young and black, we're all Democrats, that's how it is, that's what being young and black is. And so I realized there seemed to be something going on and the media wasn't covering it and no one was talking about it and particularly no one in the mainstream political establishment had any clue and didn't seem to really care you know, what we were thinking or how we were different from our parents. And that really didn't sit well with me. And so I, you know, I kept saying to friends, you know, if I were a writer, I would write about this. I wish you know, someone, would, someone should do something about this. And one of my friends actually introduced me to a literary agent at a party, and he said, you gotta talk to this person. Um, he's a literary agent, tell him about your book idea. And this, and keep in mind, this was just an idea. It was literally just something I had said. If I could write, I would write about this. I didn't have anything on paper, not, I wasn't a writer. You know, here I was just out of college. And so what happened is, and people say this like never happens in New York, I do the New York thing, which I really didn't want to do because it's embarrassing and awkward, especially if you're not used to doing it. But I did try to talk, you know, oh, well, so-and-so says that you're an agent. I have an idea for a book. And you could see his face thinking like, Ugh. you know, it's like being pitched a film script, right? If you're a director, you're always getting someone who's, or, or a producer, someone trying to pass you a demo or whatever. But he was very polite. He let me talk, as you can tell I like to do. I talk a lot. And I had been just talking without taking a breath for probably two minutes. And then he puts his hand up and he says, can I get a word in? And I said, sure, what is it? And he says, I only handle novels and fiction. So I had just been like running my mouth. Mm -hmm. And it was so embarrassing and awkward and I wanted to crawl under the table at this hot party. And I said, oh, okay, well, it was nice meeting you. And he says, well, how far along are you on your proposal? And I said, what's a proposal? Oh, you know, wow. I didn't even, you know. And he says, well, how much of your the book have you written? I was like, oh, it's more of an idea. So I was completely embarrassed, and I left the party. And a week later, I got a package in the mail, and it was this book titled How to Write a Book Proposal. And it was from the agent. Wow. He'd attached his card. So, and I think this is, this actually, this is important, I think, because to me, it's the power of gratitude. I sent him a box of cookies to say thank you because I felt it was such a non-New York, non-competitive industry thing to do for him to do that. And he didn't know me that well, he just knew I was a friend of a friend and I sent him a box of cookies to say thank you. And the day after he received the cookies, he sent me an email and it said, Kelly, see below. And I read from the bottom up and he had sent a note to another agent at his agency and said, I met this woman at a party, I don't know anything about politics, I don't know anything about this topic, but she had this idea, what do you think of it? And the other agent responded, and she's the woman who went on to become my literary agent. Within, it was within a month she signed me as a client.
So the first book, which was titled Party Crashing, How the Hip-Hop Generation Declared Political Independence, and it was really about generational differences among the civil rights generation and the post-civil rights generation or the hip-hop generation. And again, it really came from these conversations with friends who I was talking to when I'd say, well, what do you mean you're an independent? Aren't you, why aren't you a Democrat? That's what we do. And you know, they would say, no, I got a lot of issues I vote on, and I don't appreciate someone taking my vote for granted. And you know, my parents don't get it, but this is how I feel. And, and so I felt no one was talking to this group of voters, and no one was paying attention to them, and I certainly didn't hear our voices being heard. And so I want, it started out with me just wanting to interview them, and then I ended up uh, partnering with Suffolk University's Political Research Center to do a poll um, of that generation as well. And so we did that, and that's you know how the book started, and then I ended up interviewing people like Russell Simmons and Colin Powell and Al Sharpton and Cory Booker. Um, and I was, you know, I was completely unknown, so the fact that these people were willing to talk to me, I thought, really said a lot that this hadn't been done before. Um, so that's how we started. Here's what's interesting. When we had the initial idea for the book, and this is completely true, I remember when we were trying to shop the book and I was an unknown, unpublished writer, and you know, she would hear things from you know, certain uh, editors that like, oh, it's an interesting idea, but you know, it's hard to sell black nonfiction, or it's an interesting idea, but you know, I don't really know why anyone would be interested in this. The moment Barack Obama starts announcing and hinting that he's gonna run for the presidency, all of a sudden people were interested in the idea of the book. And surprise, surprise, we then get two offers once it's clear that he's running for president. And we got two offers on the book, and it was um, published by Basic, which is an imprint of Perseus. And even when the book was coming out, there were still people who, you know, behind the scenes who were saying things like, well, you know, he's, he's not going to win, but this is such a clever book, you know, or this is so interesting to take a look at this group of voters that, that it'll still be an interesting book. You know, even when he loses Kelly, it'll be an interesting book. And of course, we all know how that turned out. So the Iowa caucus happens, my book had just been released, and then it was like my life completely changed. I mean, I started getting asked to go on television nonstop because, you know, I was one of the only people who actually really talked to young voters, who talked to them early, um, had talked about the power of black voters too, um, and uh, this coalition of color. And I actually had a chapter in my book called The Rise of Generation Obama. And remember, this book had been worked on for like a year. so. It was, you know, I didn't have a crystal ball, but I'd been studying this group and I knew it was possible he could win because of talking to these voters and that it changed my life. I wasn't a professional writer. I mean, I'm someone who sold a book on an idea and then because the idea ended up panning out, I, I, I backed into becoming being a, a writer, which is why I say it kind of found me because I was then asked to write for places. I think the most profound thing, which today doesn't seem as profound, I think at the time before Obama was perceived as a viable candidate, this was more profound at the time, I was su surprised at how much um, the polling data matched up with my conversations. Because, you know, there are times when, you know, you surround yourself with a certain group of people, and so they may think one thing, and then when you start actually researching, it just completely doesn't turn out your hypothesis is proven incorrect for whatever reason. But the polling was pretty much, I mean, on point all the way through. I mean, when you'd ask questions like, we, you know, we had questions like, of the following, who do you, whose opinion do you value most? And we had people like Jesse Jackson, Al Sharpton, et cetera, et cetera, on the list. And the two people, and this was, the polling was done, I guess, in 2007, the two people who kept coming up and splitting were Oprah Winfrey and Barack Obama, right? And then the younger you went, you saw the influence of people like Russell Simmons. But, you know, if you looked on mainstream media, whenever there is, quote, there, at the time, there was, quote, unquote, a black issue, we all know who was put on camera, right, or who was asked for an opinion. And so things like that that kept popping up. And also, of course, um, I'd say another thing that was really interesting, um, and I wasn't sure how this would go, is that the younger you go, you found that younger black Americans actually have similar attitudes about gay rights as younger white Americans, um, in that we found that 18 to 24 year olds, I think half of those we polled believed in some sort of partnership benefits for gays and lesbians, which if you turn on the news, you, you know, you're under the impression that all black people hate gay people, right? That's something that's not covered. But again, it's because how often do people actually ask the questions and do the polling? It's like people make these blanket assumptions. They have the five people that they interview for comment on every black issue. And then the story gets told that way. So. There was a lot, I mean, a lot of stuff that was just kind of fascinating, and I thought, you know, positive in what came out of it. The interest in politics, the interest in, um, you know, being politically savvy, which I think a lot of people didn't think young African Americans were. All of that was just really, I thought, refreshing and interesting. Well, it depends on which one of my bosses is breathing down my neck the loudest, I would say. 
Um, I have a column that's due uh, on Mondays or Tuesdays, depending. And I'm on air uh, pretty much every Monday on MSNBC on the Dylan Radican show, so tune in. And, um, and I do some other TV shows when a schedule permitting. So my craziest days are actually Sunday through, I'd say, Tuesday. I mean, those are really my nuttiest days. And those are days when I'm um, working on columns because I sometimes talk about my piece on the loop that's due on Mondays. I sometimes talk about that on MSNBC, and sometimes I'm talking and writing about something completely different. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm working on my columns. And then I have a book that was due, and I'm not going to say what date it was due on, because why dwell on that? Um, but I have a, a book that was due a little bit ago, and uh, so I'm constantly working on columns, and I'm working on the book. And uh, one of the other things I'm now working on for the loop is I'm specifically working on some of their special reports coverage. Um, which is their polling. So I'm doing a lot of the strategic work on that. So basically my day, it really, again, revolves around which buyer I have to put out first. I mean, columns have to go up, so those are always the priority, whatever days they're due. And then in the days in between, you know, it's a juggling act and you're hoping that no ball hits the ground, whether it's getting an interview done or trying to get another couple pages of the book done um, or trying to, you know, map out um, our editorial work on the, the special reports.